welcome to the uncolored, <laughs> uncolored vidcast. <sighs> I gotta get that right. Um, I'm Kevin Metcalf, and today what I wanted to do is go over this uh, video that I saw years ago, but uh, it popped up again uh, with Dave Rubin on his show, uh, The Rubin Report. That's the old one, I think, not the one on The Blaze. And he's uh, interviewing DJP, and they're talking about um, different philosophies. And <clears throat> just to set it up, DJP's making up. What he's doing is explaining some of the deficiencies and the ideologies of what I think he's referring to are the people who call themselves in this group of the enlightened. Uh, if you don't know the enlightenment, it was something that happened somewhere around the 18th century where groups of intellectuals began to reject the idea of God as a creator and began to try to understand the world or reality without the idea of God. Um, many of the great people would be people like Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, Freud, Darwin. These are the, in my opinion, sort of the, the, the big three who in the areas of biology, um, uh, psychology, I guess it would, would, be, would be Freud, uh, and philosophy uh, with um, Nietzsche, who began to try to understand the world minus God. Now, a lot of goofy ideas have come out from that, because I, I think that once you remove God as a foundation, and again, I'm, I'm not talking about people who believe in God or people who don't believe in God. That's not the issue. You believe whatever you want. I'm simply talking in an ontological sense. Um, once you remove God from the picture, then things stop making sense. So that's what uh, I think DJP is trying to get at the heart of, is that once you remove that, that central idea, that there's a creator of everything, and what I call the first idea in this big idea theory that I've got, <laughs> it tickles me that I even have a theory. So that's... Um, but... What, what DJP is saying is that once you remove God, there's all these holes that pop up and it becomes difficult to assert the things that many of these enlightened people assert as true. But not only does it become difficult to assert these things, but you get off into all kinds of goofy tangents that you can't correct because there's really no sense of right and wrong in a godless universe. And again, I don't care whether you believe it or not, that's your business. I'm simply saying in an ontological sense. Uh, so here's here's a little bit of the interview, uh, and Dave ends with a question about two, what would happen if you put these two ideologies, uh, you know, in, in different different islands, and what would happen? Why would you need God in a sense? So this is um, DJP and 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 uh, Dave Rubin. See, I guess in some sense, I'm more romantic in temperament than Sam. And I think then his followers too, and because of that, I can see the irrational and malevolent side of human beings, I believe, much more clearly than they can. And I also think I have far more experience with that sort of thing. Yeah, so do you think that, so we, we, I don't want to get too lost here, but yeah. so we'll, we'll try to wrap it up here because yeah. there's so much I want to do with you here. Um, so let's say Earth is crumbling, we have two ships, we're going to send the people that believe what you're saying here, basically, that we need this sort of religious underpinning. And then the, the Dawkins, Sam people, they're going to take their 100 people, you're going to take your 100 people, we're going to go to two different planets and set things up the way they should be. You know, blank slate for, for each. Well, I guess the part that I would struggle with here is mm -hmm. to understand how, the, how their ship lands, they're rooted in science and in, in basic liberalism and, and acceptance of others and all that, how that society would not flourish it, mm -hmm. from the from the base level if we could just reset now I, I think you could make a great argument that we can't do it here because there's just so much history here and all that stuff but if we were just resetting on another place why could we not do it that way and have it work well first of all you know there's an assumption that science and the scientific worldview in some sense has won no, and, and because it's so self-evident, let's say, because of what it can produce, that people just will accept it and move forward with it. But I'm not sure about that either. I mean, I think there's a strong anti-science movement afloat now. I don't think there's any reason to assume that a scientific attitude of that sort would be stable. Um, 
I mean, it, it's only 300 years old. Yeah. 400, I mean, people don't like it when I say that because, okay, fine, you can chase it back to some degree to the ancient Greeks, you know, barely. Right. But really, it was Newton and Bacon and, and Descartes. And, and that's not very long ago. And we take it for granted, but there's anti-science movements popping up. Well, look, the whole debate over biology to some degree yeah. is, is profoundly an anti-science movement. And, and not unconsciously so, consciously so. Right? Yeah, very consciously Yes, very so, consciously so. so yeah. So I, I don't think that there's any reason to assume something like that would be stable. There's no evidence that it's stable. Let's mm -hmm. So a couple of thoughts. First of all, you know, me trying to uh, expound on the ideas of somebody as brilliant, in my mind at least, as Dr. Jordan Peterson, perish the thought. Okay, so the, this is dumb guy philosophy, <laughs> is what we're doing now. Um, here's the problem that I see. Uh, and I think I've talked about this in another video. It's that once you, and I, and I, and I, alluded to it earlier, but once you take out this idea that there's a creator of everything, suddenly things, you, you start to come up with problems that are unanswerable, okay? Uh, for example, let, let's imagine that, again, we'll use the puzzle piece example. So you've got these puzzles, these puzzle pieces sitting in front of you. Um, one group of people understand that the puzzles have this manufacture. There's a box, the manufacturer's name on there uh, and there's a picture and so they understand that these puzzles correspond to these picture and by looking on the box I don't know if they have instructions or anything like that um, I haven't done a puzzle in many years um, but if there's some instructions on there you at least know or you could call the manufacturer email them send them a letter and go what the hell am I doing with these puzzle pieces and they would explain to you the purpose for which they created the puzzle pieces but if you have a group of people who deny the existence of a manufacturer of these puzzle pieces, it becomes hard to understand what you're supposed to do with them. Or to put it differently, it's hard to understand that there would be some wrong way to interact with these puzzle pieces, right? Because that isn't to say that if you don't have a manufacturer, you don't have a box, that you couldn't figure out that, boy, these things seem to fit together in a certain way and the more I, they fit properly, or in a certain way, because properly doesn't exist anymore, I get a picture. And you can assert, even without a manufacturer, that this is what they were intended for. But not necessarily. right? Because you can have somebody else in your group who denies the existence of a manufacturer, and he's taking the pieces, and I don't know, he's, he's heating them up in water and making puzzle soup. And that's what he wants to do with these puzzle pieces. Now you can walk over and go and go, hey, listen, if you put these things together and make a picture, I think that's what it's for. And he goes, no, 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 that's not what they're for. They're for puzzle soup. It used to be a picture, but they were cut up specifically so it's easier to make soup. Okay. Now, if you don't have a manufacturer that you can call and ask and say, hey, are we supposed to be making soup with these things? And he goes, no, you're supposed to make a picture. Only an idiot would make soup with them, right? You don't know. There's no way to tell. All, whatever anybody wants to do, they can do. There's no right, there's no wrong. There's only things you would like to do with the puzzle pieces, maybe make them you know, into a picture, or things that you wouldn't like to do with them, like make soup or, or you know, wear them on your head or, or stick them to, to your face or whatever it is. There's just things you like, things you don't like, if there's no manufacturer, okay? But if you recognize that there is a manufacturer, then there is a right and wrong. Me putting these things together so that it looks like the picture is the right thing to do. I can even judge good and bad. I can know whether I'm doing better or worse, right? Based on the progress that I'm making doing it. All of these things, I can now make judgments on my behavior with regard to these puzzle pieces because I have a creator who created them for a specific purpose, right? So in this world, the first idea, there is a creator. I get purpose. I understand the origin of these puzzle pieces. I know where they came from, and I know why they're here. So that gives me purpose, and I understand the origin of those puzzle pieces. That gives me right and wrong, good and bad. Over here, I don't even know how these puzzle pieces got here. I, I, 
it's they magically popped into existence. I have no idea. There's absolutely no explanation for the puzzle people puzzle pieces to be here in the first place. I'm happy that I've been saying puzzle pieces so far without even more mistakes. So I'm going to leave that one alone. Uh, there's no explanation for the puzzle pieces, and if there's no explanation for the puzzle pieces, there's no purpose because anybody can make up whatever purpose they want for them, which means there's no right and wrong. So I have a circumstance where I can't go to that person and say, you're not supposed to be making puzzle soup. I can just say, I don't want to make puzzle soup, but you know, I guess you could make it puzzle soup if you want to. Over here, I can say, listen, they could still make puzzle soup. It doesn't mean that they can't make puzzle soup because I know that the manufacturer didn't intend them for that. But at least I can say, well, they're making puzzle soup, but that's not what these were intended for. That's not the purpose of these puzzle pieces is to make puzzle soup. I at least have that much. I can know right from wrong over here. In Dave's Island, there's no right and wrong. Things you like, things you don't like. Now here's the second problem. So on Dave's Island, Right, where they're just kind of, you know, trying to organize themselves. Dave loves, you know, he thinks the world should be organized under libertarian principles. You do your thing, I do my thing, never the twain shall meet, unless, you know, we, we want that to happen. I'm down for that too. Okay. But in Dave's society, that works as long as we have the power to make that work. It's not working because it's right. It's just, that's what we want. And if we have enough people who, who want that and can maintain that, we can continue to do that. But when the person over there who's an authoritarian, who says, you know what, your freedom and your liberty is in the way of my utopian you know, vision, my little utopian scheme, now we've got a problem. And if they have more power, then Dave's group on that island, then they win. But neither side is right or wrong. Dave's side isn't right because they like libertarian principles. It's just that's what they like. And the authoritarians aren't wrong because they want to subjugate anybody who would deign to oppose their authority. They're not wrong. That's just how they think the world should be. Because there's no creator and no purpose, you can make up whatever you want to. And all you get is things I like and things I don't like. But if there's a creator, at least we know or have some ability to refer to the creator and determine, should we be putting people in prisons who disagree with us? Or should we be allowing people to be free to make up their own minds about how they're going to move in the world? Right? Should we be murdering children because they haven't been born yet? Or does every life have the same rights and the, and the same ability uh, to be treated as human, regardless of how old they are or where they're located? We have a reference point for that. We know what's right and we know what's wrong if God exists. If God doesn't exist, we just have other people who have their worldview, the way they want to live, and if they have enough power to force that on you, and remember last video, I guess it was last video, I don't know, I, I forget what I'm saying. If they can coerce you through arms, if they can coerce you through financial means, taking your job away, if they can coerce you through rhetorical means by demonizing you uh, for not agreeing with them and gain, your, gain power over your freedom that way, that's what they're going to do. So it, it, it so... The problem I see in Dave's world is it's not like the things that happen on Dave's island wouldn't happen on an island where you recognize that there's a creator. It's just that on Dave's world, there's nothing that you can do to condemn the things that you disagree with as wrong because there's no such thing. There's only things that you don't like. But in a world with a creator, you can know what's wrong. You can know what people should do you can know what people shouldn't do. And whether they do it or not, that's a whole different question. But I know what's wrong. Right? I, I know when you have biological men competing with women, right? Biological women, you know that's wrong. That's not what the creator intended. So 
that's the problem with I what I see with with Dave's world, you know, it's Dave's question. And I don't want to say problems question because Dave's answering an honest asking an honest question and I love Dave Rubin even though I I criticize some of the things that he says. Uh, I think what he's doing is fantastic and I'm and I'm glad he's doing what he's doing, but that's the problem I see with the idea of the enlightened. Um last week I showed you that video with um Glenn Lowry and Daniel Markovitz. You know, they're bouncing around this idiotic idea that meritocracy is a bad thing, right? That people getting jobs and getting positions and leading uh, groups and societies based on their ability to do a job, their their vocational acumen, right? Markovitz says it's a bad idea. That's just stupid. But there's all these weird ideas that go on in the academy and uh, in the academy, like I'm part of it, in, in academia. Uh, because many of them are enlightened. And enlightened people cannot justify their ideas uh, in the terms of what's right and what's wrong. They can only justify or assert their ideas in terms of this is what I would like to see. And this is what I would not like to see. But who cares? What I would like to know, what's right and what's wrong. But you can't get that in, in, in an enlightened philosophy. There, there's no such thing, or at least there's no foundation to assert those kinds of ideas. All you can do is say that I would like this. But that's what they're saying over there, and they think the opposite of what, you, what you're thinking. You know, last week I uh, was talking about empty vessels. A lot of these ideas come packaged or at least contained in that vessel of, well, this promotes human flourishing. And as I illustrated last week, that can mean totally different things to different people. It has no meaning unto itself. So to say that, well, this is good because it promotes human flourishing, there are people who are smart as you, who have just as much science as you have behind it, who have just as much politicians who say that the very opposite thing leads to human flourishing. So to say that something leads to hu human flourishing is saying absolutely nothing. And if there is no objective, supreme arbiter of these things, then that's all you get. People pushing their, their opinions on you and trying to coerce you into being controlled under those ideas. Um, I think that's all you can get. All right, that's enough of me. Uh, what I'm going to do now, thankfully I kept this one pretty short. I'm going to leave you with another drop of uh, Delano Squires, an, an, a brilliant man. I'm going to let him set it up for himself. Uh, thanks for tuning in to the Uncolored Podcast. Please subscribe. That's what they say. They go, tell them to subscribe. <laughs> yeah, whatever. All right, here's Delano Squires, and uh, thanks for tuning in. Delano, anyway, wrote uh, a piece that basically updates the Willie Lynch letter. And Jim, mm -hmm. I don't know if you, the Willie Lynch letter mm -hmm. is, is probably more of a myth because uh, th there is no actual proof that Willie Lynch actually existed. But Willie Lynch is this alleged slave owner back in the 1700s, 1800s that wrote a letter on how to make the perfect slave. And, and people, Farrakhan referenced it, I believe, in the 1990s at the Million Man March. And it kind of took on a life of its own, and people started talking about it again. But there's actually no proof that it existed. And Delano has written a piece uh, that kind of like it's the updated version. It's the 1986 version of the Willie Lynch letters uh, from a writer who uses the pseudonym Richard Snip. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so, Delano, anyway, tell us the point of your article today, why you wrote it, how you executed it, the whole nine. Sure. Um, recently, I was, I was watching a, a scene from the movie Great Debaters, and it was a scene where Denzel Washington, and, and for people who are not familiar with the movie, it talks about a debate team at a historically black college, you know, back in the early 1900s, who went on, in the movie, they went on to beat Harvard in a debate. Um, and Denzel Washington's in the lead role, and he's mentoring a number of students who want to participate in the debate team. So at one point, he's talking to them, he ends up talking to them about the Willie Lynch letter. And towards the end, he said that his goal and the goals of the, the goal of the professors on that campus is to help the students to find, take back, 
and keep their righteous mind. Because part of what Willie Lynch was doing, right, what the letter was supposed to do, is teach slave owners how to keep the slave's body and take their mind. Mm. And Denzel's part was, again, find, take back, and keep your righteous mind. So I can't say how I came about, you know, finding this letter. But for the sake of argument, let's say I wrote it. Um, <laughs> the, the point of it, the point of it is the same thing. Because as I look on the, the landscape, particularly in black political discourse, and I'm gonna be very specific when I'm, when I'm say, saying here, right? There are certain things that are so perplexing to me that the only way for me to explain them is that there is a, a spirit of delusion and mind control that has worked its way through the black body politic. And my goal in writing the letter is to wake people up to that, to get them to understand hey, the things that you're saying, do you even understand why you're saying them? And maybe if I presented it in conspiracy theory, because oftentimes th those get a lot of traction, maybe people would, would listen to it. So I I'll give a quick example. Last week, you know, we talked about it, Jason, and you know, the, the Texas law that would ban abortion after six weeks or when a, a, heart, a fetal heartbeat is detected. And the number of black elected officials, political pundits, um, cultural analysts who all, in, almost in unison, were talking about how terrible this law was and this attack on women and all this other stuff. And I, and I thought to myself, one, well, clearly they, they, they do believe in gender and that there's such things as male and female. But even more important than that, it was disheartening to see black folk arguing that a bill, a law, that would lead to more black babies being born is a tool of white supremacy. And it wasn't just them. The people that I know in my real life, friends, family, guys at the barbershop, who when you hear them talk, you would think you were speaking to a, a second year uh, gender studies major at Wesleyan, right? Instead of the guys who, who claim to follow the teachings of King and, and Malcolm X and, and some follow the teachings of Farrakhan. And all of that is just, is so perplexing to me. And I, and I was trying to figure out, you know, how did we get here? And that's, that's really what I was trying to do with, with the letter. And, and it starts, the cardinal rule is that always and in everything, keep them, black folk, fixated on race. Rule number two, teach them to value our opinions and the our being white people our opinions, our beliefs, our actions more than their own. And if you can put, drive those two stakes in the ground, then you can get busy and, and do some real work. So the rest of the letter was just sort of recounting um, what Richard Snip was talking about at the time and mapping it onto the current state of our you know, political and social uh, condition, particularly in, in the African-American community.